lounging the bar with the gorgeous geeks. And I have some very special guests with me here today. Flex, and many of you may know him, and Mr. Brandon Easton. So what? tell me about Lion Forge and what you all are doing here. Um, Lion Forge is a new company. Um, but they don't seem, they don't really seem new. You know, they're doing, doing a lot of good stuff. They have a lot of properties. Um, one of the properties is a, a, a comic book that uh, I co-created and uh, it's called um, The Joshua Run. It's an idea I had a while ago. Uh, met Dave Stewart II and uh, then hooked up with Brandon Easton and uh, made magic. And now we're here and uh, it'll be out in about two weeks. Wow, oh, that's awesome. So tell me a little bit, so you're the writer on the book. And so tell me about some of the things that you did, because you also wrote well, Thundercats as well. Yeah, the, the, the new uh, 2011 version of Thundercats that was on Cartoon Network. I was one of the writers for that show. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how did you get hooked up with Flex and with Lion Forge? Well, I met Lion Forge about two years ago at, a, uh, at San Diego Comic-Con, mm -hmm. at the Black Panel, actually, mm -hmm. when um, they were doing a Dwayne McDuffie uh, mem you know, memorial. And I talked about my experiences in Hollywood, and Dave, the CEO of Lion Forge, approached me. And I started helping them develop some ideas, and then about a year into it, they were like, oh, well, you know, Flex Alexander. I'm like, of course I know Flex. I used to love one-on-one, -on -one, you know, set in Baltimore. Um, you know, I love that show, you know. And uh, it's my hometown. And so um, we got hooked up, and immediately we met, and we clicked on so many different levels as people, most importantly, but also as creators. And what we put together is very much like, you know, Eagle Eye meets Enemy of the State meets the Born Identity. I mean, it's really incredible stuff, and, you know, it's all based on Flex's idea. And I can't wait to see where it goes because it could easily be a movie or a TV show. Right. So how did you, so I, I take it you've always been a comic book fan. Yes, yes. I, but from back in the day, I loved uh, uh, X-Men, of course. I loved Power Man and Iron Fist, Master of Kung Fu, uh, just uh, everything. Uh, Spider-Man, it's a big comic book fan. So this was easy for me. You know, I, I don't keep up with them as much as I used to, but I'm getting back into it. Um, so this was um, right down my alley, you know. Um, it, we, we've gone to a couple of the, uh, the uh, comic conventions. We were at Wizard World in St. Louis, uh, um, WonderCon in uh, Anaheim, and now here. So just, you know, Lion Forge is getting some traction, and um, they're doing some really good stuff, you know, and I think they're, they're going to be a major force to uh, be reckoned with. And, um, you know, we got a uh, great writer and our artist, um, uh, who's also a brother, uh, and it's just it's just nice to see that you know to see brothers uh, uh, getting together and and being able to do something because most of us you know we can't do that but uh, I'm excited right. yeah you know as growing up um, there were a lot of times where I got picked on and teased personally yeah. for being involved in for reading comics yeah. like I was involved in it like when it wasn't popular right me too so. So how did, you know, a lot of times people hide their geekdom. Uh -huh. So were you like closet geeks or were you just like pulling books no. out in the class? I, I was, we, I had a group of friends and we traded. We had our books in plastic, very neatly put in there. No air touching it. I mean, it was sick. It was crazy. So no, I didn't hide it. I mean, but I was around a, a, a group of uh, kids that were all about that in the South Bronx. You know, I had a we got we had friends that uh, we traded comics. We had friends we did uh, baseball cards. So I was into all of that. So I didn't hide it at all. What about you? Well, when I was growing up, uh, it was kind of tough being a geek openly. I mean, my high school, everybody was into sports, and we had our geek crew, but it was like they were the crew, and everyone knew it, and they were, everybody knew us. Mm -hmm. I had the fortune of kind of being able to fit in with like everybody a little bit. I mean, I wasn't cool enough for the cool kids, but I wasn't geeky enough for the geeky kids. So I kind of found this like niche, and a bunch of other people did. But you, we used to get pecked on, and like there were times when I had to fight. Like I, I, wore, I told a story this morning in a panel. I wore a Spider-Man shirt to school one day, and the thugs at the school did not like the fact that I had a Spider-Man shirt on. Like it somehow offended them. Uh -huh. Like I could have had like you know upside-down crucifix, and it was just it would have been the same as wearing a Spider-Man shirt. You know, they were just on. They were just, and it, it was tough. I put it like that. So um, it, I like seeing how the, the modern age has a lot of people openly getting into geekdom. And it's been commodified in a sense. I mean, people are making money off of other people's geekdom. Because I was saying earlier, when you look around, there's a lot more stuff about comics than people buying comics. 
So there's more t-shirts on the floor than comic books. That's interesting. But it also goes to show that the world has changed a lot and it's cool to be a geek man. And it's very interesting to me. From a sociological perspective, I'm still shocked about how different everything is. Where you have young ladies openly being geeks. Where that was something you didn't see. Right. At least not good looking girls. I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> no, because like this is a great title for your podcast. So uh, I'm just thinking to myself that it's great to see everybody out of all back men, women, blacks, Latinos, Asians, whites, the whole nine. Because for a long time, particularly like you know more than ten years ago, it was all like a smelly white dude thing. Right. You know, and I was a little bit tired of that. Right. Because right. I know, but about ten years ago when I really, really started going to exactly. cons, right. like you did, like to see a girl there. I mean, like me and my sisters, we always went. But it was so rare yeah. to see girls at these things. Even doing cosplay, it was very few right. cosplay right. girls. Right. So um, do you guys feel, I know I feel vindicated. Do you guys feel vindicated with all of the movies? I, or? Knew, I knew it would all happen. It's just, you know, some of them I feel vindicated, but I, you know, some of them, these producers want to, you know, make it so Hollywood instead of sticking to you know exactly what's going on like in Batman and with Bane there were certain elements of Bane that they didn't stick with and um, you know yeah <laughs> it's yours um, no but uh, um, other than that though I'm happy that they're getting um, they're getting light and I just wish they would stop making Thor like a comedy comedy relief <laughs> so how did you come up with the idea for your it was an idea I had originally for a television show and I was uh, talking to a friend of mine over at Lionsgate Films, and he was trying to do a TV show, and I told him I had this idea. So we started talking about it, developing it. Um, you know, I, was, I had, had it developed in uh, the characters, and he ended up leaving the company. So I pretty much was stuck with, the, with my idea, and uh, a friend of, a mutual friend of uh, Dave and ours introduced us. Uh, Dave is the CEO. And uh, we started talking, and I told him the idea, and um, he, he, he liked it, and he said, I think this could work. And um, the more we talked about it, the more excited I got. Uh, cut to, you know, sitting down in L.A. at lunch uh, with Brandon and a couple of the other guys, and, you know, we're on our way. So is it going to be more paper bag, digital, like how? It will be digitally concentrated on, um, but we will have paper bag. We, ha we have to have paper bag. I mean, you have to have that. I'm old school. Like I'm not gonna go. I hate to say this, but I'm not gonna go online and read it. I need it in my hand. Right. So um, uh, we will have those for the diehard. Yeah. So are there gonna be any like voiceover special? I mean, anything with for the right, digital? For right now, I don't think so. I think it'll just be the comic itself, the book itself, and down the line, we hope. You know, the hope is always to, you know, go series, film, and even uh, video games. So, uh, you know, we hope that happens. I believe that if this can catch on, it will. So do you have any, so you're a writer and you've been in the business. Yes. So do you have any advice for people who are writers who are starting to Absolutely. get started? The first thing I always say to every writer, I, I do a podcast called Writing for Rookies, which is all about aspiring science fiction and comic book writers. What I usually tell folks is to make sure you finish what you start. So many writers have half completed screenplays or half completed manuscripts or only the first two sentences of a short story done, yet they walk around calling themselves writers. That's not what a writer is. Right. You know, I, I, there's, there's a phrase I came up with, and I say that the literary marketplace is littered with the corpses of half completed manuscripts. <laughs> and a lot of writers don't get that the market has changed considerably. A lot of writers walk around thinking it's still 1986. Mm -hmm. It's not. They still try to approach the industry without having an internet presence. They try to approach the industry without really reaching out to people face to face. They don't go to conventions. A lot of writers make excuses for themselves. And I've seen people who I know may be more talented than myself, but they have no drive and no ambition. And most importantly, they have no vision. You have to figure out a way to market yourself and create a brand. And if you're not doing that in the 21st century, you're not going to be a writer. So that's what I, I mean, that's my key general uh, set of ideas that I give every aspiring writer. Like, finish what you start. Don't worry about following trends. If you want to do a story, do the story you want to do, but be aware of how you need to get it out there. That's my best advice. So is there anything else that you guys would like to add? 
No, just, uh, you know, everybody, you go to lionforge.com and uh, where you can download uh, the Joshua run and also uh, more Brandon stuff like Roboy and uh, you can see a list of uh, what he's done. And just follow Lion Forge and, um, and see that uh, uh, this is going to be real corny, but see that they are forging their way into this industry. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so where did the name Lion Forge come from? I we got to ask Dave. We got to ask Dave. We got to ask Dave. Uh, uh -huh. Dave's Stuart II. He's the CEO, the brainchild. <laughs> he would be the one you have to ask. Yeah. Okay. I have a hint of it, but I'll let him tell okay. you. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time out and uh -huh. uh, speaking with us on today. You're welcome. I'm Gina Barr from the Gorgeous Geeks.